Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this BAFTA Film Awards session on editing. And I'm delighted to welcome our three guests here this afternoon, whose body of work is both diverse and quite brilliant. Um, to my far right is Hank Corwin. Um, Vice is Hank's second BAFTA nomination uh, for editing, following his earlier collaboration with Adam McKay on The Big Short. Um, I think it's rare to get an editor who has produced quite such a diverse body of work um, from the frenetic world of, of Oliver Stone's films through to um, the more ruminative philosophical work of Terence Malick. Um, amongst the films that Hank has worked on is Natural Born Killers, The Horse Whisperer, The New World, What Just Happened, and Song to Song. Next to him is Tom Cross, and frenetic is another word that I would use that captures the thrill of Tom Cross's stunning BAFTA award-winning work on Damien Chazelle's sophomore film, uh, Whiplash. He received a second nomination for his work, again with Damien, on La La Land, and he's also had edited Joy, Hostiles, and The Greatest Showman before collaborating again with Damien and receiving his third BAFTA nomination um, uh, for First Man. And finally, to my immediate right, is Adam Goff. Adam was an editorial trainee on Alfonso Cuaron's Children of Men. Um, then he was an assistant editor on In Bruges, The Secret of Moonacre, Solomon Kane, both parts of the Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows um, series. And he was an editor on Bees Make Honey before he returned to work with Alfonso Cuaron on Roma, gaining his first BAFTA nomination. Welcome. Hello. Thank, Thank you. you. Adam, let's, let's start with you and working with Alfonso Cuaron as a co-editor. Um, I gather you were working on another project initially while the, f the film was, uh, filming of Roma was happening? Uh, yeah, so I got back in um, sync with Alfonso a couple of years before Roma started. So uh, he was looking for an editor and was doing a commercial. So that was kind of my job interview. So I was in lined up to do whatever he was doing next. So I think Roma was the third project or script that I read. Well, I didn't read the script, wasn't given the script, but the third project that he kind of went through until it landed and what he went in to shoot. So, um, uh, yeah, so that was quite uh, daunting, going, of going straight in with that, not cutting any long, long form with him and not really interviewing or talking too much about the project and how we were going to work together apart from like the one week uh, we did short form, but um, it was rather relaxed considering co-editing, directing, producing, cinematographer, um, you know, a bit of everything. Uh, it was quite intimate, so we, sh uh, we cut in Italy, uh, no interference really from everyone, just took our time to do it and dealt with it in a relaxed manner. And in the initial stages of becoming involved on Roma, um, did you get notes from him or, or conversations about what he was kind of looking for? Uh, no, I had no idea what was happening. I had a brief outline of the project. Uh, as dailies came in each day, I was watching it for the first time, learning what was happening. So I, I didn't know. So um, uh, I was at that stage. Uh, we started editing for, like, day one of post-production, but during production I was just checking it technically, doing an assembly, learning the footage. So once we sat down to start together, I was up to speed on everything, which was needed because I didn't have a script. I didn't know what was going on. Um, Hank, I mentioned um, Adam McKay's previous film, The Big Short, which uh, you also edited, um, and you've you've had relationships with Oliver Stone and, and Terence Malick before. Um, I'm just curious about the collaboration that you had with Adam on Vice, following on from The Big Short. Um, did you feel there was this sort of symbiotic relationship you got where he was going with it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it. You have to develop. You have to develop a. a a sense of rhythm, a language, a common language with your director. And uh, once you do that, it becomes almost second nature. You know, I can, I can empathize with what Adam was saying. You know, initially, it can be a little bit terrifying. And also, as an editor, you have to feel safe. You know, you can't, you can't feel like you're in jeopardy if a cut goes south. And they do go south. Um, and, you know, on, on Vice, I mean, the, the film sometimes went on its side, but I, I, never, I never felt in jeopardy, you know. I'm curious, uh, looking at your body of work, um, and I'm not to say that Adam's work at all is like Oliver Stone's, but thinking about his approach to his subject matter 
and then looking back at um, Stone's film for like Natural Born Killers, um, almost machine gun fire editing at times, um, taking on so many different subjects and jumping around between them. Um, when you came to work with Adam on The Big Short, did he have a conversation with you about sort of Oliver Stone and, and your approach to editing? Actually, he didn't. You know, we just we just had a meal, and then uh, he told me I was hired. <laughs> 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 no, you know, the, the thing is, Oliver is very visceral, and, and his approach to things is very visceral. Adam is really contemplative. He's just brilliant. Then, like, on Tree of Life, you have Terry Malick, who's a, he's a bit like a songbird. Mm. He's... He's out there, and and you know he hears he hears frequencies that you don't hear, and uh, you know they're all different. Tom, thinking uh, about First Man, um, if Whiplash is percussion, and La La Land is melody, this this film feels very much posited between the two, in a way. Um, again, it, you have another ongoing relationship with a, a director. Um, was this easier, just coming on board and, and knowing that you know how Damien works? Um, it seemed more difficult somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was. It always gets easier in that we, early on, I you know I met Damien because uh, we worked on his short film version of Whiplash, and uh, we immediately kind of hit it off. And both of us are movie lovers, and we like a lot of the same movies. Um, and that's that's how he communicates, or a, a lot of how he communicates. He he creates these, you know, um, he's very he prepares quite a bit, and so you know either through storyboards or animatics, um, he certainly does both of those things, um, but also through a uh, list of reference films, and uh, and those with each project we do those that list gets longer and longer. But on Whiplash, for example, his big reference was Raging Bull. He said he wanted the drumming scenes to feel brutal like the boxing scenes from Raging Bull. And so, um, and, and I've had other directors when I've worked on other small projects before, um, Damien, that would say, I want this to be, you know, I really want this to feel gritty like a 70s movie or something. And then the dailies you get are nothing like that, you know. But Damien is... is is pretty close without copying, I feel like, without merely replicating. So um, so when he says, I, I want to feel like this, I have a good idea of what, it, what, he, what, I want it, what he wants it to feel like. So in that way, um, our communication just gets deeper and deeper. But again, with each project, the list of movies gets deeper and deeper to the point where I can't even get through all of them, you know. Um, but, you know, so on, on, on La La Land, of course, it was a lot of musicals. <laughs> Um, but it was also movies like about Hollywood, so there was always things like Boogie Nights, and um, it was it was a lot about Los Angeles because it was the movie was supposed to be a love letter to Hollywood and Los Angeles. Um, and First Man was um, was really he was really inspired, you know, by a lot of cinema verite documentaries like The Maisels and Frederick Weissman and, and Penn and Baker. Um, so we watched a lot of those movies. In particular, we watched. Uh, primary uh, Robert Drew documentary uh, where Cinema Verite cameras following around President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and the movie Crisis, same thing. Um, and uh, that was really key for the earthbound dramatic uh, scenes with, with uh, the family. Uh, for the space capsule missions, he wanted to reference things like Saving Private Ryan and United 93. He wanted to feel this visceral, um, you know, life and death you are there kind of uh, feeling. And so um, so all that was easy to kind of get. I think the difference between First Man and his other two movies is that he just, um, he's, he, he just shot so much film, I mean, compared with what he did before. He's, he's really great in terms of getting what you need for the editing style that he wants. He, he can be very specific. So he's great about getting um, pieces. Um, so, for example, on Whiplash, that was something like, it was a very small movie, and it was something like a 20-day shoot. Um, but within those 20 days, he had a full day, and this is like a $3 million indie movie, he had a full day just for insert photography. Um, and I remember the last scene, and again, this is like a Sundance movie, the last scene, I had camera setups that went, in, went around the alphabet a couple times, went into, I think, C-A, and that's on like a little indie movie. 
And, uh, and I remember the schedule was so tight on that movie that I told my assistants, because they started shooting in September, and we had to deliver a cut to Sundance in November, and we locked picture in December. And I said, the good news, guys, is there's no time to fire us. <laughs> so, but, but so this, so first man, you know, things, everything gets bigger, the schedule gets bigger, the crew gets bigger, um, but he shot so much more film, you know, he shot, we shot like 1.7 million feet of film and all these different film formats. And, um, and he's very demanding, like he's very, um, he just, and this, this helps all of us in a way because he takes us all along, but he's so ambitious and he has ambitious ideas for the movie and what's, what he wants to try. Um, but also what was different about this project is he shot a lot of, uh, he, sh he shot a lot of, it was all verite and it was also, I mean, a lot of it, like the action scenes are very pre-planned in some ways, but, but he always kind of was very open to having a second camera, a third camera grab things. And in fact, he shot two weeks of rehearsals with Ryan Gosling and Claire Foy and the child actors just to have them get comfortable with each other. He had them, they were in full makeup and hair and they had fully dressed sets and he just put them in that set and just had them play house uh, and then just followed them around with a Verite camera, you know, totally improvised. Um, it was supposed to just be tests, you know, and of course I wasn't even on the movie when they shot the test. Had I known how much of that footage we were going to use, I would have insisted <laughs> on being there from the beginning. But so th this, this movie had a lot more of that sort of thing. So we did a lot more rewriting in the editing room. I just want to stay with you a moment. Um, I had the pleasure of talking with members of the same team on First Man a short while ago. And one of the things I asked them um, that I think is absolutely unique about this film, um, of, of the batch of films I've seen in the last few years, it, it's not a film that, for me, is set in the past. It's very much a film that I feel was filmed mm -hmm. in the past, filmed in that moment mm -hmm. when the action unfolds. Um, right. it, 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 and part of that, I think, is down to the editing style of the film. The, you know, it's a lot quicker these days, right. unless you're watching Roma. Um, <laughs> right, right. But yeah, I find that really fascinating that I, I just got this sense of, of watching a film that was made then, not now. Was that a discussion that you had in terms of a Penna Baker's? And um, a little bit. I mean, just in that Damien really wanted it to, to feel like, you know, he wanted to channel those movies. And so, um, so it definitely, you know, came my way in terms of the editing. But it was also, I mean, I was really just taking what was in the footage. So um, Lena Sandgren, a cinematographer, uh, you know, shot a lot of it. He sh tried to shoot all of it verite, but some of it again was very improvised. And uh, and you know, in the case of scenes at home, but also Mission Control, um, you know, they would stage a lot of these scenes like Mission Control, like one long stage play, uh, where every person in Mission Control had scripted dialogue, and the cameras would just follow people around like a documentary, um, and every take would be different, and. And there would be these little anomalies, these camera things like focus racks and snap zooms and pans and a certain sort of messiness uh, that that Damien and I thought were really was really cool when we saw that in dailies and thought we could really use those things, uh, or that we would be allowed to use them, you know. Um, and and that was different from La La Land and Whiplash and. Uh, um, and it's funny because Lena Sandgren saw a rough cut, an early rough cut of the movie, and he, he talked to me about it afterwards, and he was surprised that I had used some of the stuff, messiness, messy camera move, and this and that, and, but he liked it. But he was surprised because I think when he was shooting it, you know, he wasn't merely trying to replicate Verite. These little things were just a means to an end, like he was really covering the action like a documentary, like you would a documentary camera person. Um, it's just that when I saw that stuff, I thought that was exciting. I thought, um, number one, you know, the style of the movie allowed for that. So it, I, it just meant that we actually could feature more performance stuff that you might otherwise not be able to use. In other words, if there was something, if the focus was soft or something was messy, it was still fair game, you know. Um, but also in certain scenes, like uh, some of the press conference scenes, you know, there was a way that, that uh, Damien wanted those to be... Uh, he wanted to really feel the cuts, like he wanted those to feel like an attack on Neil Armstrong. And so um, there's a place where we could use some of those things, those snap zooms and things, just for punctuation. So it was a lot of fun, but it was, it was different from the previous adventures we had. 
Hank, um, Tom just used the word uh, precision. Um, I'm, I'm, one of the things that struck me when I, I saw uh, Vice was the level of precision to the whole film. It was incredible how it's pieced together. But whereas when I saw The Big Short, I thought, oh, okay, I can follow this. I, ca I can kind of understand how this was put together. I just remember coming away, starting to have a headache, thinking how on earth do you start to work on Vice and put this together? Because you're jumping back and forth in time, you're working with fact, you're working with interpretation of um, facts, you're working with fictionalized elements of someone's life. Um, how much of the script ended up being the finished film in terms of the nonlinear order? You know, Adam, <clears throat> Adam pretty much had it figured out. Um, we ended up, we we ended up uh, experimenting, moving things around, but uh, you know, ultimately, for the way I I look at, at at cutting films, is you really go with the flow of of the material, and um, you know I I'm sure these guys screen their dailies and and take copious notes. You know, I've got binders <laughs> full of full of notes. So you know where the footage is. You, you, you know sort of what you're going to say. If there's any real precision, it's strictly accidental. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, did, did that? No, 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 I, I, yeah. I, <laughs> I guess let's, let's move on. When I think of precision um, in, in terms of vice, tempo, the, the ability for the film to race along at 100 miles an hour, then come to a grinding halt and, and, and move a little slowly with us, then to pick back up again. Well, but you know, the thing is, on a, f on a film, okay, this is, this, this gets very deep. Uh, they're, no, they're a very a deep thing. audience. No. It's no, but you know, the thing is, on a film like this, you, well, you, you, have the, you have the facts which have been vetted, and then you have the humaneness, the humanity, and uh, it's, I, I, we would think of it almost as emotional realism. So you'd have, you'd, 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 you'd have the facts, but they'd become overwhelming. So you'd have to, you know, you'd have to feel where you, you wanted to slow the film down. And like for me, I, I love like ambiguity in characters. And I, I know you had in your film, there was, there was huge ambiguity. And so, you know, you just feel your way through it. And we, you know, we had the, uh, the luxury, the dubious luxury of having many test screenings. So we would just screen the film through other people's eyes. And it wouldn't be for, it wouldn't be for, uh, for notes uh, or comments or scores. We would, we would just feel the film over and over and over. And that was, that was one of the keys to getting this film right. I'll come back to some elements of the film in a moment, but Adam, um, if we're talking about tempo. Um, everyone knows that Alfonso loves a long take. Um, more often than not, an incredibly complex long take. Um, you came onto this film with no idea of what the script was. Um, you were being sent dailies. I, I'm just curious how you go from there. <laughs> Um, well, it was quite easy to read when the footage was coming in with the, the camera moves and the blocking of working out where he wanted to go with it. So um, it wasn't that it was too much of a puzzle to, to start with, to build it. It was really kind of just finding that rhythm to, kind of, to follow it. So um, what Alfonso did on this, and it's great having an editor behind the camera, is he understood he wanted like longer tails and handles on all of his shots. So he would leave the camera rolling maybe up to a minute or after the kind of the dialogue had finished, just let the scene play out and he would let the actors kind of maybe ad lib or continue to live in the moment and just let the camera roll. So we had the options of, we, we didn't have to cheat anything. We had these like very, very long elements to kind of cut in and out of, sometimes minutes. So um, I think that was kind of the ch most challenging element of finding that rhythm. But the rhythm was really, it was following the pace of the footage, like the, this, it's being set in that first shot with the water coming in. So you know you can feel the flow and then the long camera pan around and then following Cleo at the house. So it was just trying to follow it elegantly 
and not to break the flow. Um, within that, you're, you're still cutting. It, it, it's, it's just one of those things I find really fascinating with Alfonso, looking back to Children of Men and the, the extraordinary childbirth sequence, of, of, of still knowing when you need to make that cut at the end. And, and that thing fascinates me. You, we talked, you just mentioned the opening shot, um, which is stunning, not only trying to work out what we're looking at, but then suddenly seeing the reflection of the plane going across the floor, going across the sky. Um, as you worked on your own on it, and, and Alfonso was also working, how much freedom did you have to sort of play around with things, or did you guess pretty uh, quickly? Uh, for when I was working on my own, that was just for me to learn the footage. So okay. day one, that's all out. We start again from scene one and just work, uh, work through it. So it's really just to kind of understand where we're going with it. So the challenge was the amount of shots that he would be shooting. So a good example, well, our, our, our max example is the scene in the hail where Cleo tells Sophia that she's pregnant. He shot that 60 times, and that's a three minute 45 wow. shot. So when I line all those down, that's <coughs> three hours of dailies for the same thing. And there's all l lots of little differences in it as well. So he was still experimenting with attention within the family. So because the, uh, the actors were getting uh, sides each day, he would be giving different kids different sides. So they might have different bits of dialogue because he was trying to create this tension in the shot and people would talk over each other. So we ended up with different options and strong options. So it was a deci decision making process of just finding where we wanted to go in that. And I think just making that select at two days in the cutting room of just reviewing talking about it, experimenting. Sometimes we would put a couple of different versions in and see how that would play because you would find that it would affect something else. If we ever changed a shot, then we were then trawling through scenes either side to make sure that that rhythm would then follow it. So, um, but then once we kind of had that built up, it was just a moment of just doing passes on it. So having to tackle it in long runs to make sure we kind of had that correct rhythm going through and going back to the hail one it, actually i only like realized this the other day i was just looking at um some of the bits kind of pulling some elements and um the last line of dialogue so when we've kind of finished that scene where they just relax and they settle is about 12 seconds before we then cut to the next scene so we're kind of just setting these beats so we're trying to not make any cut on comment just to let you then take it in and just gently move along. Tom, uh, thinking about Damien's background in music, his, his love of music um, and the musicality of, of the films, um, how much does that play upon the, the work that you produce and then sort of the conversations that come out of that with, with Damien? Um, quite a bit. I mean, Damien, uh, his background is he was a competitive jazz drummer. Um, so... Uh, Whiplash is kind of based on his personal experiences. Uh, um, I don't think he had a teacher that slapped him around, but I, I think he had a teacher who was pretty rough, <laughs> would play kind of mind games. Uh, but uh, but I, you know, besides me taking piano lessons and studying a little violin, I don't think I could read sheet music today to save my life. So I'm not a musician. Um, I like to think I know what sounds good or what sounds right, but I'm definitely not a musician. So I really defer to, I always defer to Damien's uh, taste and judgment in, in that regard. But um, I would say music really um, plays a big part in the picture editing, or at least it did certainly in Whiplash, but also La La Land and, and also First Man. Um, we set up this kind of uh, style of, of working on La La Land where our composer, Justin Hurwitz, was uh, in a room next to my editing room. We shared a door. And so as soon as I, as soon as Damien came in to start his director's cut, Justin started alongside us. And in the case of La La Land, you know, he had to be on early on to prepare uh, all the music that they were going to film to. Um, he ended up kind of doing the same thing on First Man. I mean, he worked out a lot of his uh, melodies and a lot of pieces uh, during pre-production, and he would feed them to Damien. Um, hundreds and hundreds of drafts. Uh, there might even be a thousand drafts, I don't know. But he would bounce these things to Damien, and Damien would, would give him notes, say no, you know, and they'd go back and forth. And so by the time I started cutting, I already had a lot of his 
rough demos of Justin's music. And I always use those to inform how, how I was cutting things. And in the case of some of the scenes like the uh, lunar landing, um, you know, Damien had kind of a rough animatic of that that I tried to follow. Um, and it had, the animatic was done with storyboards and, and archival footage for picture and for audio. It was just some bare bones sound effects and then Justin's rough demo. And so I would kind of, you know, um, have that as, as my pad to kind of uh, start with. And as dailies would come in, we'd, we'd kind of overcut um, and kind of go from there. And then once Damien came in, um, you know, then, then, you know, we really, that was very, those things end up being very, very rough. I mean, again, Damien pre-plans, uh, really well, but I always find that, um, you know, the animatic and, and just trying to copy that is always just a, that's just a starting point, you know. Um, I always find cutting to an animatic, in some ways it's great, in other ways I find it really terrible because then I feel like I'm, my hands are kind of tied because I'm just trying to match, uh, you know, I'm just trying to match a plan and it's always very hard for me to match it because so many things have changed, you know, when they shoot it, this, oh, this is this shot, supposed to be you spend a lot of time trying to figure out is this shot in dailies is this supposed to be this shot in the animatic and it t it, it feels like it takes so long to kind of get a straight answer about those things um and once you put it together it it always just is this kind of mechanical thing you know that doesn't really have any soul and so uh, but you do it knowing that that it's just a starting point and again it's it's a little bit like what Adam is saying you know um that process that daily's process is is just a great way for you as an editor to get to know the footage to organize it the way that you know where you'll so you'll know where to find everything um, and so that's a lot of what it's like with Damien. Um, but so music really, you know, plays a strong part and certainly in La La Land, but also in First Man, because we were always, we never had any other, uh, for the most part, we may have had one piece of temp music from another movie, but everything else was, was rough demos of Justin Hurwitz's score. So we were always temping with his music and from the very beginning. So I always had his stuff and, uh, and we would go from there. And so because he's right next door, um, he's there every day. If we stay till two in the morning or four in the morning, Justin's often there too. And um, it's kind of a little bit like a television sitcom where, you know, we just kind of open the door. And sometimes people don't knock. They just open the door and say, hey, do you want to, you know, do you want to come take a look at this demo? Come take a listen because I just changed it. Or or the other way around, where Damien will just pop in and say, Justin, come in here and look at this thing that we just did. Um, and so it's very unlike other projects I work on where the composers come on a lot later and you know they're, they're a little bit of a slave to the picture. Here, there's a much more of a back and forth, and so I'm really cutting um, to match the picture. And in fact, uh, we had a great music editor on the movie, Jason Reuter, but Often, you know, Damien doesn't want to, since he has a musical background, often he just wants to work out the music edit in my room with me, you know, because he knows what edits he likes and what edits he doesn't. So I find that I end up executing a lot of these music edits to, you know, and then once I do these things, um, you know, then that informs how we're going to recut picture, you know. So there's, uh, there's a lot of, like, you know, that cycle of back and forth uh, happened constantly on First Man. Um, Hank, thinking about the music um, for Vice, uh, BAFTA was lucky enough to have Nicholas Brutel here earlier the, today talking about Beale Street. Um, and he also composed the music, uh, well, he's composed the music for both of Adam's films that you've worked on. Um, how does that relationship work? You know, it's <clears throat> it sounds very similar to what, what Tom has going. Uh, we're very close. We're, we're close friends. And what will happen, even before, when I'm looking at dailies, I'll have him just come watch with me. He'll sometimes just plug his computer into the board, and he'll play me tones. And then Adam will come, and we'll all talk, <coughs> and Nick will go off, and he'll give me sketches, and I'll cut them in. But, you know, it's, it's the most fantastic thing to have the opportunity to work with a, with a composer right from the beginning. I'm spoiled. I'm sure you are. I, I, it's, it's the most awful thing to, to be presented with music. It's a fait accompli 
after the fact. We, you know, so Nick, in, in a sense, as, as Adam, became co-editors. And, you know, we all became sort of, and I, I use this, uh, I, I use this gingerly, but we were sort of co-composers on, on a very limited level. Um, go ahead. So with that in mind, um, I think one of the interesting challenges of Vice that it succeeds with is presenting a knockabout comedy of a frat boy who decides to take himself seriously in the first half. And then we suddenly encounter tragic global events in the second. Humor still exists, but the humor gets much, much darker as it goes along. And I just felt that both the editing and the music played a significant part in that. And I was wondering how, how much of a challenge was it to get that tone right throughout as it shifts? You know, there, it, it, again, it was it was a matter of trial and error. We wanted we knew where we wanted to take the film, you know, it, but there, you know, initially initially it 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 felt a little flamboyant, and then there was, you know, there there became this this almost profound reverence for power, you know, and 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 we were we were almost afraid of it as uh, you know as, as as the team working on the film but nick you know nick's music actually helped guide it you know and he cuz he he created musical arcs that we were able to plug into adam um shifting from tone back to tempo um just thinking about, it's, it's such an epic film in scope, Roma. Um, and again, like, like Vice, and very much like um, First Man, the, the shifts are quite extraordinary throughout. Um, could you talk a little bit about the conversations that you had with Alfonso about the lead up to the riot scenes? I thought you were gonna ask me about my score. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the lead up to the riot scene. Um, for that, there was, it was again, just building it as it kind of ran in. Uh, that first pass on it wasn't actually too difficult. Where it started getting tricky was when we were working on the rhythm with the vocals in the background. So we had these great recordings of crowds chanting. And then we would revisit that scene in the build up where we were kind of with those chants, we were going between them, trying to set some geography outside for the group, setting the scale. So uh, that was probably one of the more challenging elements in that build up there. But I. For Roma, anyway, I see everything kind of in movements, almost yes. like an opera. So part of this cut goes from them arriving in their car all the way up to the berth. So I see that almost as one rhythm, as, as it would be. So that the, the, the cut is kind of, it, the shots are probably getting slower, but we're building tension using sound kind of all the way up to the, to the berth. Um, and then another scene that um, I personally just, uh, desperate to know about, and I, I don't know if there were alternate shots to this, but the scene at the beach, it is one of the most extraordinary shots for anyone who's seen the film. You're, you're watching someone watching people drown, possibly drowning, and it, it, still, it, it still makes me incredibly nervous thinking about that, of how I felt while I was watching that sequence. Um, was that a decision made right at the beginning, that is the shot we're going for, or were there multiple perspectives initially? Um, that's all they had. So that was actually an easy one to edit because the, the day before there was a I storm. Oh yeah, that's all they no, had. Yeah. No, the day it's before, a great scene. The, the day, they built a pier going out into the sea that they kind of had the track on and had the camera on a crane, would go out with it. And there was two days before there was a storm and it washed it away. So they, had to, they were in a rush to rebuild it. And in that rush, it didn't, they didn't set it well. So it kept the camera kept derailing. So we have one complete shot. So no, that was that, yeah, that was kind of easy. What, that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I comped the birds in at the beginning because I because <laughs> we did have another shot that you know a few that did start. There's none that made it to the end. So you mean there's just one take? Yeah. That's, isn't that amazing? That was an easy day at the office. That's <laughs> just cut off the slates, comp in the birds, and you're done. Job done. Okay, Adam. <laughs> We're going to erase that part of the tape. Oh, yeah. We're going to go back, and you're going to give us a really complex reason for how this happened. We're all going to think how brilliant that is. It's all CG. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, everyone's seen footage of a lunar landing. 
Um, and yet, it, it, to, to still have that thrill in a fiction film, a recreation of that. Um, again, the, the, the same people were talking earlier about the lengths they went to to, to, to get that right sound. But it, once all those um, shots had, have been put together, it is an extraordinary sequence. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the challenge of actually putting all that together? Well, the, I think the big challenge in general for that, for the whole movie, uh, really, was how can we show the audience things that they haven't seen before? You know, how can we offer something dramatic? Can we offer something emotional um, that uh, the audience is going to feel in, that they can invest in and that they haven't seen before? Um, because I think the, the thing that we knew we would have to fight is the iconography, you know, or, or we'd have to work with it, but we could not merely just offer up Neil Armstrong, the icon. We had to offer some of his humanity. We had to offer um, very personal and intimate things that, that people are normally not privy to. So I think for the moon, that was, that was one of the biggest ingredients is to, um, is to find a way to show things that, that people hadn't seen before. And so people, you know, I mean, most people know images or footage of Neil Armstrong climbing down the ladder and make, taking his first step. And we knew that we would have to show that because we owed that to the story. But, you know, a big part of it was, okay, now can we go off on this other moment um, and spend time with Neil Armstrong alone, where, uh, which really, really did happen. There's some speculation as to did he really do this thing that he did on the moon? Um, we don't know. That's kind of speculation. Um, but we do know that he did spend a certain amount of time alone standing at a crater where he was off radio comms and where he was away from Buzz Aldrin. And though that was a moment that, that Damien and the screenwriter Josh Singer really wanted to dig into because then they felt like if, if we could um, somehow let the audience... <coughs> get into Neil Armstrong's head a little bit, or, or at least to show this private moment that they might begin to have an idea of what he might have been feeling, which um, I think was something really important to Damien. So, um, so we, we, you know, we leaned into the subjective um, storytelling. And what made that easier was, uh, was the IMAX photography. So, you know, we had kind of set up this thing, this first person um, kind of style earlier and just right from the beginning in the X-15, but certainly we carried that forward in the Gemini 8 sequence where uh, we leaned heavily on these point of view subjective shots where you would see things through Neil Armstrong's eyes. He's approaching the Gemini capsule. Um, in IMAX, we could, you know, the, the, the resolution of the image kind of allowed us to kind of hold on those shots and slow down and, and invest in them more because you could really, um, there was more to look at in, in the picture. You know, you could really focus on the grain, the fine grain of, of the soil, and you could, you know, you could, you could hold on that shot of the gloves climbing down the rungs of the ladder because you could really see the stitches in the gloves. And it, it just kind of invited us to hold things longer. And so in that way, we could kind of double down on this subjective you are there um, style where, you know, hopefully the audience is feeling like it's their, you know, it's their step that they're taking on the moon. And once you kind of get into that headspace, um, our hope was that we could kind of pivot to this more emotional thing where we start having these flashbacks um, and he starts seeing images of his family. And all of that, by the way, is, is, uh, is not really in the script. That's stuff that's culled from uh, this 16 millimeter verite footage, uh, rehearsal footage, um, and that's just something we played around with in the editing room. I think this is something that that all three films that are so different have in common. It, they each take on an incredibly large issue, whether it's a geopolitical situation in Mexico uh, in the early 1970s, the la lunar landing, and as um, as Christian Bale alluded to, the Antichrist. Um, <laughs> the and yet they, they all three films drill down and end up being incredibly intimate and, and deeply personal. Um, Hank, I just, I just want to ask you, but the thing that, that in many ways personalizes the, the story of Dick Cheney is the humor that comes out of a film. And I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but there are a number of elements, a, an interesting appearance of film credits, 
reference to Shakespeare, and we find out who someone is quite late in the film where we didn't even realise it. Um, knowing that certain things were cut out, people have talked about the, the locker room scene with uh, Christian Bell with his shirt off. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, were, were those things that just, just worked straight away and you knew that you, you had them? Because they come out as quite big surprises throughout the film. Well, the... Um, the... The credit sequence was was actually very well planned out uh the locker sequence locker room yes. the is it, it was also very well planned out uh there wasn't much room there for spontaneity adam had adam had actually thought this stuff out um but there was there was a real balance between the seriousness of it and the um, and the comedy. Adam Adam comes from an improv world, you know. So he'll shoot many many takes, just having having his actors uh, go in many different places. So it became a very subjective thing, you know. How, what is funny? What is not funny? Uh, and uh, well, that's 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 pretty much it. Um, if you haven't seen Vice, it's still showing in cinemas. Um, I know Roma is available on Netflix, but there are two or three cinemas still showing it in London. Do not watch it on streaming first. Watch it in the cinema. 70 mil at Prince Charles. <laughs> there we go. And you can see First Man now. It's, it's been released on DVD and Blu-ray. Thank you very much to BAFTA for organising this event. But most of all, can you please join me in thanking our guests today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.